All right. Well, my guess is that people are still signing in, but I want to go ahead and get a prompt start for those who are right on time. Are you uh, Are you ready on your end, Kate? I'm ready to go. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy season to join us. Um, we're going to be going through today with myself at from Good Shuffle Pro and Kate from Kate Pate Consulting to through the five steps of staying ahead in this busy season. Very much looking forward to it. So to give a quick intro to ourselves, my name is Karen Gordon. I'm the Vice President of Growth here at Good Shuffle Pro. Good Shuffle Pro is technology for the event rental, decor, and design industries. We have Good Shuffle Pro, which is our software for companies to manage and run their entire business. And I have a background in both tech and events. I worked in the events industry for many years and the tech industries. And when I found Good Shuffle Pro, it was truly a match made in heaven in terms of combining my love for the events and life experience industry and my love for technology and how it can make businesses grow and work faster and better. So um, really, really excited to be here with Kate Pate of Pate Consulting. Yes, thanks for having me today. Uh, for those who don't know Kate Pate, I have Pate Consulting, which I've owned for a couple of years now. I have a background in the catering and events industry. I was at events conference centers, hotel casinos for close to 15 years, uh, switched to the dark side of being a vendor for a little while, and then launched my own firm. And one of the very first things that I said when I met Karen and I saw a good shuffle was, where have you been all of my life? Because this is some pretty amazing software. So I jumped at the chance to do this webinar and talk about something near and dear to my heart and making sure that you're staying ahead and you're taking care of yourself in the busy season, which we all need to do a better job with. Great. Well, thanks, Kate. And actually, Kate, we're getting a couple people chatting in saying that you're a little bit tough to hear if you're able to get a little closer to your microphone. I am. Is this any better? I actually just took the case off the laptop. It might have been covering it a little bit. Yep. It looks like we got one yes, so that should be better. Thank you. Thanks for the heads up, you guys. I appreciate it. Yes, and feel free to chat us as we go along. Um, we are happy to, uh, we're going to be doing some question and answer at the end, as you can see here, but feel free to chat us as you think of questions, and we may not address them in the middle of it, but we will get to them at the end for sure. So please feel free to send us a chat as you think of questions. And as you can see here, what we'll be covering today is we're going to go through a five-step plan. Um, we're going to, instead of going through all the tools and resources at the end, what I'm actually going to do is email everybody with some links to the tools and resources we mentioned. So you have those actionable. We don't need to go over each of them. Um, and then, like I said, we will leave some time for some question and answer at the end. Yes, I know that we blocked an hour for this, but in trying to keep everyone's time valuable and important, if we can get through it quicker, we absolutely will so that you can get back to your busy days. So with that, we're going to jump right in. All right, perfect. So um, I put this quote in here. It's from the Earl of Chesterfield. Now, if anyone there knows about Earl of Chesterfield, you'll have to let me know. I have to confess, I don't know who that is. But I just enjoyed the quote so much. Take care of the minutes and the hours will take care of themselves. It's something that I feel like we constantly have to remind ourselves. I feel like, you know, we're a pretty startup, you know, small company. And we are constantly thinking about a mix of both big picture things, you know, our big growth and the big things that are happening for our company, but then also these tiny little minute details of the day to day. And that is so true of the events industry. And it's just helpful to remember that when you take care of the minutes, those big things will really take care of themselves. They will. And this is a big one that you do have to take care of yourself. The fact that event planning is considered the top five most stressful jobs in the country is insanity. It shouldn't be that way. It's, we're not saving lives. The fact that it's firefighters and police officers that are ahead of us, I feel that some people wear it as a badge of honor, this busyness and overworking. And that's, that's not the case. It's, you need to do a good job. You need to do the right thing by your business, by your industry, but you need to do the right thing by yourself as well, which is taking care of yourself because you can't pour from an empty cup. You need to fill yourself up first. So it is not, it's not the glorification of business. We're going to figure out ways to get through it quicker so that we can have better work-life balance all around. Yeah, well said. Can't pour from an empty cup. I love that. So step one, diving right into kind of a five-step plan here. Um, so the first step we would recommend to do when you're really thinking about this upcoming busy season, whether maybe it's for you, it's the fall is really the busiest time for you, it's the summer or it's right, right now, 
the first thing you want to think about is time thieves. So time is really your most valuable commodity when you're in events because this is a very human driven industry. Whether your expertise is your creativity, whether it is, you know, you're on the culinary side, you're on the design side, um, you know, whether it's just your years and years of experience working in this industry, there's so much that is powered by humans. Of course, this is coming from someone from the tech company, but truly there's so much that is just really reliant on you. And so you have to recognize that your time is your most valuable commodity. And that's always going to be short. And so one of the things you want to look for is what are the things that are stealing that time? Because it's basically like stealing money from you. It really is. This is one of the things that I go through with my consulting clients consistently. I work with a mix of hotels, with rental companies, with individuals, planners, different brands. And that's one thing we look at is what is stealing your time? Where are you putting your time and efforts? And is that going to your bottom line? Is it making you money? Is it the right place to spend your time? And we're going to dive into some of those tips um, a little bit later on one of these, but just to touch on it, looking at what you've done in past seasons and how you can streamline where, where you're putting your efforts and what the best ROI is for you on that. So it, it's the number one thing that you need to look at as a company and whether you're a one man show or there's a thousand people in your division, seeing who is spending their time everywhere and streamlining that process is huge to your overall success. Yep. And there's a lot of different ways to track it. You know, I'm actually going to send out two tools that I found as part of our kind of toolkit that I send out after. One's called Stay Focused. One's called Rescue Time. Um, I won't personally recommend either one, but I just found so many interesting tools kind of in looking through what other friends of mine recommended as well. Um, there's a ton of tools out there if you want to actually have something on your phone that's helping you track this. Um, and even if you're not using a tool like that, it's really important that as you start finding a way, whether it's manual or through a tool, to track your time, that one of the things you're noticing is what are the things that are easiest to kill? Because there's never enough time in the day to do all the things we want to do or need to do, but some things are easier than others to simply kill or reduce. Um, an example that Kate and I were chatting about earlier was, was clothing. I personally, for me, was the perspective of I mostly, my, most of my meetings are on the phone, most of my you know, meetings in the office are pretty casual, um, and quite frankly, I'm not very fashionable. So I thought, what a great way for me to cut one thing out of my day. Um, I started doing, I did some reading on the uniform, which has become a pretty popular movement. I, I personally don't have a uniform that I wear every day, but I started saying most of my clothes are black. I started buying more clothes, leaning into it, and pretty much saying, this is gonna make my life easier if I, for the most part, 80% of the time, wear roughly the same thing. And that's just one example, but that's something where, you know, we're talking about what's something that's taking time that with a small tweak would be killed. That time would be killed or reduced. And on my side, as far as the wardrobe goes, because as a brand and image consultant, I need to pay attention to it, but I find ways to still look fashionable without putting a ton of time and effort into it. And it starts with closet organization. Everything's arranged by season, by color, and then also by how... Uh, just how dressy it is really so everything from gala gowns on one side to dresses to present in on the other and then putting pieces together i buy so many classic pieces that you can mix and match it makes it so simple to do and working on your time there's actually a really cool thing i saw as far as timing and it's a cube that you can buy to put on your desk and it tracks your time for you automatically it'll it'll tell you how long you've spent on each one and you can even have it alert you but basically it's a cube and you flip it and whatever side is up if it says email that's what you're working on if it says you know clients whatever that might be what your job looks like it tracks that for you and it actually goes to a spreadsheet. So if you do billable hours, like I do a lot of billable hours, if you do that and you need to know how long you're spending on a specific client and showing that, there's there's tools out there that'll automate that for you. They're just, they're so cool. And they look interesting on your desk as well. I love that, I need that. Now you're like Googling cube, right? <laughs> I really am. I really am. I, um... Yeah, so what is the easiest to kill can also be done via finding what are the things that you can automate, which brings us to our next point. So, um, of course, as again, the tech person and the tech representative here, a lot of my thought on automation is via tech, which we'll cover as well. But there's a lot of things that you can think through of how can I make this faster? How can I make this simpler? How can I make this happen automatically instead of redoing a process over and over again? 
Oh my gosh. The email templates are the biggest. That is one of the things I talk to every single client about. I help write email templates. If there's something that you send consistently or someone in your office does on a regular basis, if it's a request for a proposal, if you're sending quotes, if you're sending follow-ups, those typically tend to have the same messaging behind them. So to use canned responses that it's one click and all you have to do is personalize that first and last line, that makes it so easy. And so many people are using chat bots. It's artificial intelligence that answers on your behalf for you if you're in a business that, that you can utilize that from. And then different ways that you can qualify your leads. Not everyone is your person, and that's okay. Not all business is good business. So figuring out ways to qualify those leads and have some upfront questions so that you're not taking the time and working with someone who either isn't in the right budget or isn't the right fit or maybe not looking for exactly what you have. So figuring out how to qualify them in advance and having some qualifier questions right there as soon as you contact each other and just streamlining your tools. You don't need 15 softwares to do everything. There's ones out there that do so much. I mean, I actually personally did switch to Good Shuffle because I could use so many parts of it. I don't have inventory in, but the way I send out my billing, my invoicing, I follow up, it does it all for me. So figure out what you need. There's a software out there for it. I promise you that. Yes, I love that. That's something, you know, industry-specific tools, you know, Good Shuffle Pro is specifically for event rental, event production, event design, anyone in the event industry who has inventory. We also work with some venues and catering companies, anyone with uh, inventory. But even outside of our tool, there are tools that do things that, you know, are well outside of what we do. Um, you know, there's beautiful tools for uh, food ordering, floor plan creation, employee time tracking, um, you know, you name it, it's out there. And I actually just did a really fun webinar with All Seated, who does some floor plan creation, um, about shopping for software. And I am going to include a link to that webinar. And again, we're going to send out a tool set at the end. So you have lots of action and items. Um, and one of the things I really emphasized in that, in that talk was that I think a lot of folks that I talk to at trade shows and in meetings say, I just didn't realize there was a tool out there that does this, or I don't think, you know, my business is so unique. Um, those are all great. That's true. I'm sure your business is unique, but you know what? The tech industry is huge. You should always double check and see, is something that I'm doing something that someone else already solved for? Um, in addition to sending out my webinar that I did with All Seated, I'm also going to send a link to Capterra.com. Um, you know, no affiliation with me. They're just basically like a, a Yelp.com, but instead of for restaurants, they're for software. So that's a great place to go for a resource. You can see um, user reviews. They're very strict about user reviews. You can actually trust them. Uh, a lot of our users will get questionnaires from them as soon as they write us a review because they're very careful to make sure you don't just pay off people for junk reviews. Um, so it's a really great resource to actually see what other folks are saying about a software and a great place to look to see, is there a tool out there for something that I'm currently doing that could be automated. You'd really, truly be surprised. There is so, so much out there. I mean, coming across, like you said, with All Seated and how they can interface with every other platform that's out there. Um, StaffMate Online, the fact that they can do not only your staffing, but then also go in and do the um, payroll side and get Ubers and Lyfts for people to where they have to go and then the risk management and, and escape routes. Should we need that risk planning? We do need that sadly in this day and age. It, there's literally something for everything. Right. Yeah, it's incredible. And then another thing that's important to note is that um, you've got to stop and think about you know, what really does require a human. So again, you're going to be surprised to find the tools that will replace parts of, of that human effort. Um, and one of the ways to figure out, well, what would I even start looking for? Because I think that's one of the hardest things is, well, where do I even you know, start looking? Uh, you know, if you Google something like catering software or event software, you're going to get a million options. Start thinking about those time thieves again, coming back to that first step. Um, you know, am I seeing a lot of my, my day is, well, I go tell Mallory and then Mallory goes and tells Colin and then Colin goes and tells Andrew. Okay. Well, right there, there's clearly a problem, right? Uh, we know that humans are required for beautiful, creative design. We know that humans are not required for communication <laughs> across, you know, an office. Um, what are those time thieves? And, and another thing that you can do in terms of automating that, even if you're not using technology right away is is using standard operating procedures, having a procedure that's very clean cut, that's not just, oh, well, usually Bill asks Bob, who asks Joe, and then we go back and count that inventory, or then we go into call our vendor and double check the food orders on the way. No, 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 no. 
there has to be a clear cut procedure because that's one of the fastest ways to reduce the time thieves. Absolutely. I go through so many SOPs. That's one of the first things we write. I'll be flying out to a couple of rental companies over the next month and going through it. The rule of thumb, basically, I learned this from my very good friend from ProM Events down in Phoenix. And what he said, he had his laundry system go down for a day, which is you can't do that in a rental company. You can't lose your laundry. And when he walked back and asked why, they said, because George isn't here today. That's not <laughs> Because someone's not there doesn't mean that your system shut down. If there's a process, if it's more than one click, there needs to be something in writing on paper so that anyone can walk back there and take care of it. So having SOPs is the best way to keep everything moving, moving smoothly. So it's a well-oiled machine. It is vital to the overall success of your business that anyone can walk in and step into any role needed anytime that hit by a bus syndrome I feel like that's a terrible thing to say I'd, I'd rather say oh sorry they had bad sushi yesterday they're out today so <laughs> can we still do the job without them it, you have to have SOPs in place I did have an old boss of mine who used to say what happens if someone's uh, away at tuba camp which was his nicer way of saying what happens if someone gets hit by a bus I found you know it was a little eye roll worthy back uh, back in that day I was, you know early 20s I thought it was so corny I, I use it all the time now <laughs> funny how that works <laughs> Well, and then getting into the miscellaneous side, the social media, schedule out what you can, put together a social media calendar. I have a ton of those that I use. Um, you know, use a strategist if you need help. I've talked to Nick Borelli from Borelli Strategies numerous times. He puts together some of the best social media strategies and saving specific hashtags. I actually go into my phone and I've gone into my shortcuts and I've put in things that I type consistently, like my email address, hashtags I use so that I can just start putting in two letters or a symbol and they'll auto populate for me. But having that ready to go, and I don't mean automate to the point that you can't be relevant. You always want to leave time in your social media. So if something does happen spur of the moment, or there's something that's very industry specific, that you can still jump in and do that. You don't want to be robotic about it, but having things in place and ready to go to help fill your time. And another thing I do is I use digital cards a lot. I don't know if everyone else has lost the ability to write by hand. I feel like I missed my calling as a doctor because I love sending thank you notes, but I can barely read them myself. So there's digital cards. You can go on and type in what you want and it's laser printed on and it looks just like ink, like you wrote that card. So you can go in and have cards sent out, mailed on your behalf. And a lot of times I have my earbuds in and I'm walking and talking through an airport, doing my digital cards and everyone gets a nice little note from me. So anything that you can make, anything that's manual that you can make automatic is huge. You know, if, if there's auto replies, I'm not a huge fan of the out of office consistently. I see a lot of people doing it and I understand in busy season, there's a time and place, but if you're truly out of the office Friday, Saturday, I would only use it those days. There's people that I email that every single day, no matter what day of the year, I get an autoresponder that says, it's my busy season. I'll get back to you soon. I stop reading those. They, they just, they become fluff. You pay no attention. So if you truly are busy, use it in a positive way saying, thank you for reaching out. Today is Saturday. I will be with a bride. And when I'm on site with a bride, I make sure they get my full attention. So I'll be back in touch when I'm back in the office on Tuesday morning or whatever that looks like for you. But set the expectation and let people know so they do get a response and it's an authentic one. And make it fun if you're going to truly be out of the office. Tell them why. If you're at a conference, tell them you're at a conference that you're going to learn the latest tips and tricks so that you can better serve them and learn industry trends, whatever that might be. Or if you're on vacation, that you're taking some much needed R&R &R so that you can come back and be the best possible version of you for them. There's so many ways that you can make manual tasks automatic. And be organized. That's the biggest thing. Be organized. Yes. Well, that's a perfect segue because our next step is that it's organizing, right? Obviously you can, as Kate said, you cannot automate every single thing that would take away from the human element of your business, which for almost everyone is going to be one of the more important points. So for everything that you can't, you know, a hundred percent automate, you can still a hundred percent organize. And I would say that one of the things that that starts with is something like email, which I feel like Kate will have a great tips on, you know, I was reading up on how uh, Elon Musk apparently sets aside from 7 a.m. to 7.30 for critical email every day. Um, and I think there's all sorts of 
uh, you know, loopy CEOs that have their, their thing. But I feel like Kate, with how many clients she works with and how much she travels, uh, your email inbox has to be something that you're pretty organized about. Oh, it can be scary. Let me tell you, when I get on a flight and they tell me those dreaded words, we don't have Wi-Fi on this flight, <laughs> I about to have a meltdown every single time. <laughs> but keeping my email organized, every single client has a folder. If something is an action item, I keep it unread and I have my inbox sorted so that my unread are on top and those are my action items. And then I sort through every single one with clients specifically for it. Um, some people use different colored flags, different markers, they'll pin ones. It's really coming up with what works best for you, but I get through them. And you, the biggest thing people do, and I see it a lot, is they'll go ahead and they'll read it and then they mark it as unread and they're like, I'll get back to that. When in reality, it's maybe a 90 second response. Take the 90 seconds and just do it. It will loom over you if you do not. Just get through it, get it done, respond however you have to. I do, like I said, a lot of responding from my phone. I'm connecting on flights. I'm walking through different airports and different spots. And I have my earbuds in. And that is what the very bottom of my, um, my phone response says is it apologizes that I sent this from my phone, most likely voice text. So please excuse any autocorrects or poor grammar on my behalf because it's probably mm -hmm. Siri's fault. But get those out of the way. Don't let them sit there. Yes, you can keep them unread if it's truly an action item that's going to take more time. But the longer it waits, the bigger that list gets. And you don't want more on your plate. Just get it done as quick as you can. Yeah, and with that, it's very interesting, uh, you know, for task lists, you know, when I've done some reading on what's sort of the, the main thought, main way of thinking about this these days, there's a big conflict out there. Some people say the what you want to do is anything that's short, get it done first, because, you know, that'll just get that out of the way. But there's actually a big movement right now for not doing that, because people then kind of push off the things that matter most, because it feels like this big thing. I mean, I was thinking back into co my college days of how I would always push off the big paper I have to write and do all these much lesser things. And one of my favorite things that I read really spoke to me, said, you know, regardless of whether you want to argue for getting some of the small things or big things, one of the ways to really think about sorting out your task list for a day or a week is to think about what directly links to your revenue. Be goal oriented in your task list. So, um, you know, obviously there's a little bit of a tips and tricks here. I think Kate made a great point that when you have an email, rather than having it sit on the back of your shoulders because you're leaving it on red, if it, if it is a quick response, get that out of the way. Um, but, you know, really when you're looking at your day, whether it's answering emails, whether it's working on something, what is really going to have the biggest impact and getting that out of the way? And if that's a big, longer task, so be it, because if that big, longer task is related to your number one highest paying client, um, if that's going to be what's going to ensure that one of your most important events, you know, goes off without a hitch, then that's more important than that thing that you've kind of been meaning to do, but man, wouldn't it be easier to just call that vendor and, and chat with them and connect with them because I've been meaning to do that. That is one of the hardest things to do and one of the most important things to do is doing the absolute like hard and the task that you dread the most, doing it first. Because if you don't do that first, that looms over you all day long. Whenever I look at my day, and even I am guilty of it, I'll see something and I just stare at it out of the corner of my eye and it's the last thing in the world that I wanna do. Typically for me, that tends to be accounting. I'll admit it, I hate numbers. I'm gonna hire like four accountants as soon as I possibly can, but those loom over me. And I know that if I just sit down and I do it, it's the hardest thing for me, but if I get it out of the way, the rest of my day goes so smooth because I don't have that little thing on my shoulder reminding me, don't forget you've got to do this. And that does, that takes, it's, it's a mental game. It's a mental fight with yourself to say, all right, this is what I'm going to do right now. Set everything down and just address that big monster. Absolutely. And with that organization, you know, one of the ways to do that is some of the calendar blocking that I think Kate kind of alluded to before, right? With the, you know, looking at your day and seeing what's taking your time and then deciding how to block out that calendar, right? It is. And so this is the funny part that we talk about being so techy, but the best way I found to do this is a little more manual. And I put into my calendar everything I need to do and how long I think it's going to take. And I do my best to stick with that. But the way that I've learned to schedule my days, I worked with an organizer. That's what she does for a living. 
and we sat down together and I would put down, you know, it's going to be an hour for email, an hour for calls, whatever this all looks like scheduling lunch. Like I know Karen, you've got to schedule lunch or you will not eat girlfriend. I will not eat. (laughs) Yesterday at four o'clock, I said, nobody bother me. I need to get lunch. But if you put everything in the calendar, this is the important part though, at the end of the day, schedule yourself five minutes and go back and then readjust to what you actually did. It's going to be shocking when you have a month or three months of data to look at that you've truly calendar blocked. And then you've gone back and you've looked at it to see what you wound up doing. You might be scheduling yourself Monday mornings from eight to 10 answering emails, but it turns out that you're actually talking with clients or with staff or doing a briefing. You might find out that your best time to answer emails is between one and three because you're going back and you're actually putting in the times you did work. You'll start to see patterns and you'll be able to better block your time because you'll know what works best truly because that's based on what has been working. So put in what time you think you're going to spend on something, but then go back and update it later. Take the five minutes at the end of the day to do it. And then at the end of that first month, call me and let me know what you were really doing because you're going to be shocked, I promise you. (laughs) And then the last note here when you're getting organized is, I'm sure this is part of the calendar blocking you've done, Kate, is, is kind of having that discovery of the distractions and what's really feeding into that. Yes, you need to do zero distractions. I have no alerts on my phone. I have no alerts on my computer. I get to it when I get to it, and that's the way to stay organized. And when I was first told that, I was like, are you crazy? There's no way that's gonna work. And I would sit here and I'd be on my my laptop, and all I would hear is my phone going ding, 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 as different emails are coming through, and notifications, and oh, someone tagged me in something. I literally have a text notification and my phone rings if you call me, that is it. You don't need to be notified every time there's an email. You need to be working on the task at hand, and then you get to what needs to be done next. If you have all these distractions pulling you 20 different ways, you're going to get those regardless. Fires are going to pop up. Things are going to happen. An employee is going to walk in. A client is going to call that will distract you. So get rid of all of the other ones. Get rid of those technological distractions that you can. I close every other browser window. I used to be so guilty. I would have 20 tabs open and I'd see my little Facebook messages popping up and, oh, there's people contacting me here and all those little notifications. All they did was distract me from my task at hand. So what I was doing was not getting my full attention like it should be. And I wasn't completing it as efficiently as I could be. So shut down everything else work on the task at hand. It is so important to do that. And I reward myself when I finish something. And there's a lot of days that I'll work from my home office. I don't have to commute all of the time if I don't want to. And I will do a silly reward for myself. If I'm doing something between three and four o'clock, I tell myself I can't have that glass of wine until I finish it. So have a reward system set up, whatever that looks like for you. Um, I know Karen, we're laughing about you eating lunch, but I, when I would sit in an office every single day, I always wanted to go and get my lunch between like 10 and 11 in the morning because I eat constantly. And I would tell myself, I have to do X, Y, and Z. Then I can go sit down and take my lunch break. So just whatever that reward looks like for you, whatever you want to be doing next, that's your, that's your goal. That's what you're working towards. Finish what you need to, zero distractions. Then you get to the good stuff. Yep, I love it. And that's actually, before I forget, Kate, you'll have to help me remember, I realize on the list of tools I'm sending out after this, I didn't include the great suspender. The great suspender, when you're talking about having your other tabs closed, it's a free plugin on Chrome. We're like probably their biggest advocates here at Good Show Pro. Um, it basically just sleeps any tabs that you haven't worked on for a set amount of time. So you can either say after 30 minutes or after an hour, it's up to you. But I think I have mine set if I haven't looked at it in 30 minutes to sleep it. And one of the things it does is it helps your um, Chrome run faster because it's not constantly running all 20 websites you have opened. It just sleeps it. But then that way, if I'm, I have something I've opened, I know I want to get back to it later. You know, I'm working on Um, this presentation, for example, and I wanted to keep it open on my computer. So I'd remember to keep tweaking it, but I would sleep after 30 minutes if I hadn't worked on it. And then the same will be um, for for notifications. So if you have Facebook open and you're someone who always has to check that because it's part of your job, then you can have it sleep so that then you can go back and refresh it when you actually want to look at it. It's not constantly going off. I'm going to go ahead and make sure I add that to our tool list. Yes. Um, 
All right, so step four out of our five here is to delegate. And this is something that Kate and I both feel very passionately about. Um, it's something that I think we both got really excited to, to include as part of this. Um, I actually did a webinar specifically on delegating and hiring a rock star events team with Morgan Montgomery, who's on um, the NACE board. She's the owner of Paisley and Jade uh, in Richmond. If any of the folks out there are familiar with another event planner over here on the East Coast. Um, but she and I did a, a webinar. I tried to dig it up. We actually done it with um, NACE National and I, they're, they're looking around to see if they can find a link to it. But I'll definitely send out um, some highlights from a blog post I did about that. But part of it comes down to, of course, hiring the right people. Oh, yeah. You have to hire slow fire quick. I know sometimes that sounds very cutthroat, but it's very true. You want to hire the right person. Depending on who you talk to, it costs anywhere between $28,000 and $36,000 to train a person properly over the course of a year. That's your investment for getting someone. So you want to make sure it's the right someone and someone that will stick with you for as long as possible and is a good fit for your team overall. Putting in the wrong person could be detrimental to the success of your team. And when I say fire quick, it's true. I've had great people that have worked for me. I have people I'm still friends with that have worked for me, but have given notice at some point and said, oh, I might start looking or let me give you a month's notice so I can help out. Let me tell you, their productivity goes down. Even if they have the best intentions in mind, they have short timer syndrome and they're already one foot out the door, which then kills the productivity of the team all over again. And if it's not the right fit, it's better to let them go. If you have the wrong person there, it's like a cancer to the team. You don't want that there. So take your time, bring in the right person that's the right fit, and don't keep the person that's the wrong fit. You need a rock star team, like Karen said. That's right. going to be the most profitable people that you can, can trust. And then once you have that team, um, you need to remember not to micromanage. You need to remember to try and set goals for them. And, and you can have tasks associated with that, but how much more powerful is it to tell someone on a team, you know, our goal is to have customer service that leaves someone feeling like blank. And one of the ways we do that is we hand them a water the minute they come in. And we do that because that way they're, you know, they're not instantly having a negative feeling of, of feeling uncomfortable in our venue or in our space. Um, or, you know, we always do this and explaining why. And, and one of the reasons for that is, first of all, if you have a really rock star person, they may have other ideas or suggestions of how to do that. They might say, oh, you want them to leave with a smile? Have you ever thought about doing this? Great, <laughs> you want employees who are coming up with other suggestions. They're also gonna take a lot more value in what they're doing when they understand why. If you just tell someone and then you hand them a water, well, okay, anyone can hand someone a water. But if you describe a good story about, oh, you know, have you ever walked somewhere and been like, man, I'm just so thirsty, I can't find a water fountain. You know, really involving them in your thought process is proven to help people feel more involved in the task, it's going to, again, also provide them an opportunity to even rise to the occasion and make more suggestions. Um, one time that I really saw this pay off, I used to work at a live venue, uh, event venue here in Washington, D.C. I worked for uh, Living Socials, 918 F Street, and we had this huge team of experience coordinators, and they were all part-time. And we started seeing a bit of a turnover rate. We started seeing people who come in really like guns blazing, really excited to be a part of a new concept. Um, great young energy from these event professionals. But, you know, sometimes there was a lot of nitty gritty involved with it, like a lot of, as we know, event pickup and cleanup and, you know, difficult customers. And we started doing a monthly meeting where we talked about our goals as a business overall, where we were on our profitability, what were some of the things that we were striving for, things that investors would look at. Um, and explaining things like our net promoter score and how a lot of people were returning and we saw a higher return of business if people gave their experience coordinators a higher score. And all of this to say that when we originally started, some of these people, they were working so part-time, we didn't think they needed to have some sort of meeting like this, that they wouldn't be concerned with those kind of KPIs. But really what happened was once they saw what we were trying to accomplish and saw how important their role was, even if they were just working a few shifts a month, there was such a... a an enthusiasm around getting to that goal because it was no longer do this task, do this task, do this task. It was help us achieve this goal. And to piggyback that, just so everyone's clear, KPIs that Karen's talking about, key performance indicators, that shows people where they're at, if they're getting there, if they're reaching that goal. If you don't have KPIs in place, then how do people know what they're expected to do? So that's how you can hire, how you train, how you track, but then that's also how if someone's not living up to standards, that's what you go back to is here was the expectation. 
for it all. Um, and tracking, it goes right into the evidence and tracking side on all that and doing technology and your SOPs. I can't stress SOPs enough. I'm going to make you guys crazy with how many times I say that because they are just so important to the running of any business, no matter what you do and having great technology and ones like good shuffle in these that are out there. I wasn't kidding when I said earlier that as soon as I saw this technology, I was like, where have you been all of my life? <laughs> you need something like this that tracks it for you. They even track my emails for me so that I can go in and see my entire email chains and I can see who's done what and when. That tracking side is huge, especially if you're in the rental side or um, you know, you know, anyone can touch proposals. The fact that you can go back in and see time and date stamped who did what and when that right there takes away any back and forth you know exactly who touched the proposal when they did it what they did and then you can go back and train on that if you need to because you can clearly see oh Susie deleted this from it on this day and you can go through and figure out why did she do that it's a great tool to have to also use towards training people but it's an accountability partner on your behalf that no one can just say mm, I'm not sure or we don't know who did that Yes, we do. The technology tells us right here exactly who did it. So I love this one. And like I said, I don't have rental inventory, but I use it consistently because it helps me keep track of everything that I need to. It's right there at my fingertips and it's done for me. I'm not doing it manually. I can't say enough good things about it. And you guys, I didn't get paid for this webinar to do this. I just honestly think that. <laughs> Well, of course, thank you for saying that. But yeah, I mean, like you said, part of it is that finger pointing. Talk about a time thief is, is if you're spending all of your time going back to someone, did you do this? Or when did you do this? Or when, did, you know, did you get that done today? It's so much easier to just go in and see on a tool with whatever kind of tracker you use, um, seeing, okay, so-and-so marked this done at this time, or so-and-so, you know, sent this email at this time. Um, and, and with that, making sure that you're not in general spending too much time checking up on tasks because again, managing people takes time and that's just another time thief that you can avoid because if you use a combination of standard operating procedures of technology that tracks things, um, then you can have these scheduled check-ins. The goal should be very minimal back and forth with your teammates. Depending on how involved you are, you should really be only having once a week, um, depending on where you are, maybe once a day, but very set times where you're checking in with the people who report to you. Because if you're hiring this rock star team and you have some technology to kind of back up that they are a rock star, then do you really need to be on them every you know five seconds? Hey, did, what did you think about this? Or I think that you should talk to this client like this. No, hopefully you're hiring somebody who you can trust to do things right. You're giving them a clear set goal and how they're gonna get there. And then you can just follow up later and, and sort of do your general check-ins, which will take significantly less time. Oh yeah. And empowering your team. It's huge. Um, years ago, oh my gosh, a lot of you probably have heard of them or you've seen him speak before. Um, Footers Catering out of Denver. I heard him say this years ago and this light bulb clicked for me when he talked about empowering his team and that he gives them three questions. And if they can say yes to all three, they're allowed to make a decision for a client. And that's life changing. How many people have people walking into your office consistently asking you a question or, hey, should we do this? When you look at them and you think they should be able to make that decision. Why are they asking me something that's so minute? And the questions that he has his team answer, if they can say yes to it, they can make the decision without having to consult anyone. And it's, is it right for the company? Is it right for the client? And if I come back to you and ask you why, are you comfortable to explain why to me? So if you're making a good decision for the company, you're not going to lose the company money. It's going to be good overall. It's going to save time, whatever that is. If it's the right thing for the client, if it's going to make them happy, if it's going to make the event run smoother, whatever that is, if it's right for the client and you truly believe that, then yes, do it. And if you stand by both of those and you could answer to it later, let them make the decision. And you know what? There's going to be learning events. That's what we call it in my household. That's what we call it where my husband works. We call them learning events. It's going to happen at times. People may not make the best decision, but if you coach them along the way and you empower them and you teach them how to make those decisions, you will have so much less back and forth and you will get so much of your time back and your team's empowered and they feel like they're more part of the team in that bigger picture. You get better buy-in, you get better employees, you get longer lasting employees because they can help make decisions. They're part of your overall success. A hundred percent. And when you think about people sometimes talk about those, those learning moments, is that what we're calling? <laughs> learning events. Learning events. Those people talk about how those learning events can cost them time and cost them money. Sure. But 
what's costing you time and money is micromanaging. And what's costing you time and money is having employees who don't feel like they have a say, who are grumbling and you know, dragging their feet and rolling their eyes. Those things cost you a lot more time and money than if you have you know, time to yourself because you're not micromanaging, you have happy employees because you're not micromanaging, and then yes, the learning events happen time to time, but they're gonna cost you a lot less time and money. So the last step here in making sure that you can get through the busy season like the rock star is scheduling your sanity, um, which as Kate started by talking about, the whole, you know, event planners are up there with, I think, you know, firefighters and these incredible uh, professions that are high stress. And, you know, that's, like she said, not a badge we should be wearing. This is something that we should be trying to mitigate. We should be trying to get to our sanity. And there's a lot of different ways to do it. And I absolutely think this is something that's more subjective in terms of what works for you works for you. But we wanted to talk about a couple of tips and tricks. Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of people talk about the Pomodoro method, which is where you can take 25 minutes to work and then five minutes off. And people do that and repeat. And again, there's actually tons of um, trackers on your phone and alerts on your computer that can help you do this. There's actually this new 5217 rule that I was reading about that spoke to me a little bit more just because I like the idea of a longer chunk, like 52 minutes of working. I kind of feel like I could focus better with more of uh, almost an hour to do so. It really depends on what works for you, but setting up those alerts or creating those chunks of time so that for me, I can eat my lunch um, or for whatever it's going to take you to do, because uh, we all know that's the first thing to go. And then with that can be, frankly, your sanity. Oh, gosh, yeah. I like the five minute folder. So there's one that I heard about years ago. I've heard a couple of different people discuss this, the five minute folder. Sometimes you just need to take a break from things. You need to walk away. You need to come back with a clear set of eyes on everything because you just get so deep into it. So having this five minute folder and I keep mine in the notes in my phone and they're just little tasks and their ideas and their things I would like to do, little things I've got to get done that just, they kind of sit there and pile up. And when I just need a break or if I just find myself sitting there waiting for something, if I'm early to a conference call or I finish something up quick, I go into this five minute folder and they're all little tasks and I can just start hammering some of those out. I take one or two and I'm like, done. You feel like you've accomplished something. You actually are doing something good for either yourself or your business at the time, but just keep track of all those little ideas. And when you just need a, a five minute break from whatever you were doing, go into that and it's going to help you to accomplish a lot of those little trivial things that you need to get to but they're not quite top of the list per se and the the good health the good for everyone guys like i said earlier if if your cup's not full you can't pour from it you can't help anyone else you don't want to get yourself sick you need to take care of yourself first and i will preach that until the absolute end of time if you're not in the best possible shape that you can be in mentally, physically, whatever that might be, you're not good for other people. It's not good for you. You can't give your 100% to anybody if, if you're not taking care of yourself first. So take that time, recharge. I worked at a hotel casino for uh, some time and people used to work 12, 14, 16 hour days. Like that was a badge of honor and it wasn't. And there were times I would get looked at because I would actually leave at five or six o'clock at night. I know like, oh, what do you mean you left at a regular time? And it was because I scheduled my day. I got my things done. I had my next day ready to go. I knew it was on my list. My clients were taken care of. My events were taken care of. And I went home and I made dinner and I would go and work out. I took care of myself and people would look like I was crazy for doing it, but I could get my stuff done in eight to 10 hours max. And then I had that time for myself. Just because you're there 16 hours doesn't mean those are 16 productive hours. The people I know that spent that much time there probably did a good six hours of work because they were so tired and they weren't working at full capacity. Whereas I will come in and I would rather have anyone working for me, give me the strongest seven, eight hours you possibly can working your butt off versus maybe a half ass like 12 to 14 hours. I'd rather have a shorter amount of time that's way more productive. So take care of yourself, let your people take care of themselves, take time off, give them time off and make sure that you're the best possible you so you can be great for your clients and your teams. 
Absolutely. It's funny, you know, um, when I was working at that live event venue, it was kind of the perfect storm. If there's two industries where, you know, there's a little bit of that badge of honor where you, you know, work so many hours, events and startups are two of them. So I was working for an event startup. So there was absolutely became a culture of, you know, working crazy, crazy hours. Well, then what happened is people started getting sick. And then there's nothing worse than getting everyone on your team sick because we are, we were a very small team. And as soon as we lost two of our operations managers that left no one to be an operations manager. Um, so quickly our boss put a rule out that said, if you come in while you're sick and you get anyone else sick, you're going to have to answer all our meanest customer service inquiries for two weeks. And it was amazing to see how people's work habits changed to basically, like you're saying, they worked smarter instead of longer because <laughs> then everyone was very incentivized. We had, you know, a startup, we had a couple of mean people who'd be really mad because they're cooking class, that things got burned or this or that. And no one wanted to answer those emails. So once we were incentivized to not get sick, we were suddenly incentivized to do just the same amount of work, but in a much smarter way. I love that. Work smarter, not harder. And then, yeah, for sure. And it doesn't, it makes you look, I think, better because you look smarter. Mm -hmm. um, and why you work is another important thing to remember here. I think, you know, we can all have that guilt of, like Kate said, leaving at five or six or doing whatever it is that is for your sanity. But I think that one of the things that really helps me is, well, why am I working so hard? What is it that makes, that drives me to work really hard? And everyone has different reasons and it's oftentimes a multitude of reasons. Whether it is your kids who you wanna, you know, provide a better life for. Well, if you're not then getting time to spend with your kids and getting to see their, you know, special recital or doing other things, then, you know, you're not getting that recharge of seeing them, seeing their smiling faces and going, God, this is what's gonna really drive me to work for that extra long event tomorrow. Um, or if, you know, it's just, I really love going out, having a special night out with the gals and, and having that, you know, really delicious special wine that's a little bit fancy and costs a little bit more and that's your thing, then great. But again, if you're not getting to do that, then what's reminding you of that? If you haven't done that in three months, then what's reminding you of why you're working so hard? What a great recharge to go out and do something fun or to spend time with people and do something interesting, whatever it is that drives you, buy something special. Um, when you do that, you're getting that reminder that then you're coming back into work and going, all right, I'm going to crush really hard today because that was fun and I want to be able to do that again. Mm -hmm. I love it. So oh, nice. Yeah, we're pretty much close to time. I wonder if we've got any questions or if you want to go through some of maybe the tools and resources. Yeah, I'll send out the tools and resources after. Again, I don't want to take up too much of people's time. I wanted to leave a little bit of time here at the end so that if people have questions, they can go ahead and shoot us a chat. We'd be happy to go over any of the things that we've done in our you know, different event careers to talk about what has worked for us. If anyone has a tip that they want to share right now, I'd be happy to read it out loud. Um, you know, I think everyone has different things they bring to this, but um, I do want to also make sure that we have our contact information here. Um, obviously, we both work from different angles of the industry and are really passionate about keeping it a sane place to be. Uh, so if you have any other suggestions, thoughts, ideas, or questions, this is how you can get a hold of both myself, um, Good Shuffle as a broader company, and then Kate and uh, her company as well. Yeah, reach out if you want to email me with any questions, if you want to connect online. I am going to warn you guys now, if you follow me on Instagram or anywhere, you're going to hear some major cursing, especially after like 5 p.m. <laughs> I delivered myself with that glass of wine. But I do put up a lot of different tips and tricks at times and always happy to answer whether it's email or online. Follow along. And I know a lot of you probably heard about this webinar through our email with BizBash. Um, Good Shuffle is going to be at all of the BizBash live events this year. We're going to be heading down to Florida in a couple of weeks. I don't know if any of you will be at the Florida one. We'll be in Florida and uh, LA and DC and New York. Um, I know Kate and I are both going to the NACE experience as well as ILEA Live this year. So, uh, you know, with all the other event professionals on this call, we would love to hear from you. Follow us, reach out to us because there's nothing better, especially as the one who gets stuck in the tech office here in DC. I love finally getting to meet people in person. I do too. This is going to be fun. So yeah, you guys reach out uh, to those of you that are sending in little thank yous and all of that. Yeah. Happy to connect. Love it. Glad that we got the sound back and everyone could hear everything. So go get back to the rest of your day. Enjoy your weekends and looking forward to connecting with everyone soon. Thanks for your time today, guys. Thank you all so much for your time. And thank you, Kate.